Perfect. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Hi, I hope everyone had a great day. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us on our third webinar in our series called Here We Grow Again. My name is Brianna and I'm the Executive Director at ECW and we are hosting only one more webinar after this one. So all of the webinars in this series have been made possible through RBC's Tech for Nature and our wonderful Food for All New Brunswick Food Mentors who have been speakers for these events. So thank you just so much to everybody who made this a reality. We will be recording this webinar that you saw uh, and they'll be made available after the series is complete as well as the presentations from our food mentors. We ask that you just put your name, where you're from, and one reason why you're here today in the chat box below so we can all kind of get to know one another during the session. All participants will be muted throughout the webinar, but we'll have a Q&A session about 10 minutes at the end, so around 7.50. So prep your questions and anything for Michelle. Uh, the raise hand function and the chat box function should work for all attendees, and you will find that at the bottom of your screen for the Q&A period. So the purpose of this series is to increase our knowledge on growing, preserving, and finding local food. We thought it'd be a great way to kickstart the launch of our very own indoor aeroponic farm, which is located in Blacks Harbor, New Brunswick. Our farm will support 50 aeroponic towers to grow a variety of leafy greens, herbs, and microgreens. This is ECW's way to bring fresh and nutritious food to our community through controlled environment agriculture while giving new life to an old community asset. Controlled Environment Agriculture, or CEA for short, encompasses a variety of systems that take technologically based approach to farming. CEA can range from simple shade structures and hoop houses through greenhouses to full or indoor vertical farms like ours. The most advanced systems are fully automated closed loop systems with controlled lighting, water and ventilation. It often demands high energy usage but ECW had a geothermal energy system installed at our indoor farm location to help offset that high demand. Those of you who stick with us through all four webinars will be entered into a draw to win one of two prizes. They are a residential aeroponic tower kit for your home or a veg pod raised garden bed. So I'm really, really excited about our third speaker tonight. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Michelle Davidson, who has been engaging communities in food sovereignty for over a decade. She has earned the Master Food Preserver Certificate in 2017 to train people to safely preserve food at home and has since taught numerous groups and individuals how to can both pressure and water bath, uh, dehydrate and ferment foods for healthy, delicious foods that nourishes and sustains us all. She believes that sharing skills, talents, and our stories with each other is the best way to learn and to co-empower. Michelle has also kindly offered to donate her honorarium for the webinar tonight to Roots to Table. Michelle is grateful to acknowledge as a settler woman that the land she currently stewards is the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Like I said before, there will be a Q&A period after the webinar, so hold on to your questions or put them in the chat. We also ask that you introduce yourself, like I mentioned before, so we have a log of who's here for that important contest. And without further ado, I'd love to hand your attention over to Michelle and as always, thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, Michelle. Oh, thank you so much. Very excited to do this. Um, so normally I um, I do workshops in person where we get to sample the food and they take they're at least two hours, sometimes a little bit longer. So I'm going to try and squeeze a lot into this hour with you. But there's a lot of references and, and links to to further learning within the presentation, which will be shared with you all later. And this is being recorded, so we can always go back. So that was just my welcome screen. And please bear with me. I haven't done a slideshow in quite a while, so hopefully I won't have to back up too many times. So I wanted to start out the, this presentation with a description of how I got here. How did I get interested in doing any of this? I did not grow up with um, a family that canned or um, preserved food in any way. But when I was um, in my 40s, I believe, I had this backyard in Ottawa and a very, very abundant apple tree. And I ran out of ways to, like, I ran out of things to make for my family that they would eat <laughs> made from apples. So I went, I basically went online and taught myself how to can. And uh, I taught myself how to make fruit, le fruit leather in the oven. And I just, I really loved the sufficiency that came from knowing how to preserve my own food. In uh, 2017, I was uh, offered um, a 
an opportunity to take the Master Food Preserver Certification. So it's uh, only um, available in the States, but there was a special a group from Green Eye Co-op and I believe Food for All at the time, went to Georgia, got the training, become Master Food Preservers, and then trained us in Moncton over seven weeks, eight weeks. So it was very intensive. We learned all the most current um, research-based information about how to preserve food safely at home. So this is not um, a commercial level. This is how we can do it at home. And that gave me a lot of confidence and a lot of, um, I really wanted to share what I learned. So I put it out there that if anybody wanted to uh, to learn these skills, I would be, I would love to do workshops. So I've done a number of workshops for individuals, uh, some of them who are in the room. <laughs> and um, I've also done them for the community centers that are listed there, among others. And I'm just, I'm always willing to, to, to go anywhere in New Brunswick, really, and uh, teach people how to do this. It's really fun getting together and and uh, learning how easy this is. Like it really, if I can do it, I feel like a lot of people can. And I'm gonna try not to talk fast. <laughs> try be the operative word. I'm a little nervous, but uh, I'm excited too. So we'll continue on. So basically in the, um, uh, in the workshop, they provided us three books, the one so easy to preserve batch and the Bernardin home preserving book. It's also called Ball Online. So those links will take you to those books. But this one here, the So Easy to Preserve, it's only available to US citizens. And even for US citizens, it's like $200. It's quite expensive, but it's the most up-to-date, um, reliable information from the US Department of Agriculture. And uh, But they also provide a lot of this information free online. It's just, it's in separate form. But this uh, this book is like my Bible. Every time I, I go to do anything, <laughs> it's got drying, it's got pickling, it's got fermenting, it's got uh, canning, of course. I always reach for that. And um, and the batch is actually a Canadian title. And they take, they take it like uh, tip to tail. So they'll take one ingredient, uh, strawberries, for example, and show you how to dehydrate it, how to can it, um, how to, and then they have recipes for it maybe. But it's a it's a really uh, thorough book if you if you have access to getting that, I highly recommend it. Except um, get one published after 2016 because they had an ingredient in there that's no longer considered safe to can. It's it's called cab it's cabbage. So I'll get into it a little bit later. But there's some ingredients if they don't have a if they don't have a a safe way to can an individual ingredient, you can't add it to like a stew or a soup or whatever recipe. We'll get into more of that later. So, and that's the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Like I said, the USDA um, puts that together. They do research in this all the time. They are constantly researching new methods, old methods. They just recently added steam canning, for example, to their uh, list of um, safe ways to can at home. And they, they and that took quite a while. So. If, it, if they haven't listed it as a safe way to do something, a recipe or a, an ingredient, then you, you shouldn't do it at home. It's that simple. The internet will tell you otherwise. <laughs> There's lots on the internet that says you can do all sorts of things, but um, that, that source there, the National Center for Home Food Preser Preservation is the ultimate authority from what I've been taught. So basically all the methods I'm gonna talk about tonight um, have the same kind of, uh, not procedure, but, you need to be aware of the same thing. So I have apple pie filling there on the left and the middle is dehydrated apple slices and then applesauce. So all three of those things uh, require different methods of preservation, but I'm just gonna minimize this here so I don't, I can see the screen better. Um, but they, uh, they all start out the same way. So you never can or preserve anything that isn't as perfect as possible. So if you've had, like, you know, for example, I always think that, okay, well, if I, you know, I, I had it in the fridge for two weeks and it's not great and some of them are bruised, but I'll just freeze it and it's not going to improve the flavor by freezing it or, or canning it <laughs> or dehydrating. So you want to make sure you have the freshest possible and the, um, as, as, as good as possible. So you want to select and you want to sort your ingredients firsthand. Of course, washing, um, washing can also include the, um, the preparation for some ingredients. For example, if I'm freezing apples, um, 
I uh, sometimes I blanch them and I should always blanch them, but I'll often um, put them in a, in a lemon water first and that will help preserve the flavor and the color of the apple. It's not, it's not necessarily to, you know, you don't have to make it perfect, look perfect, but sometimes you want it to look a little whiter. So that's kind of the washing part. The cutting is really important when you're dehydrating and we'll get into that in a little bit. Blanching is one of the most important things you can do to preserve a food that's going in the freezer. And actually for the apple pie filling, I blanched it. I blanched the apples first as well. Um, color preservation, um, that's talking again about like sulfite or, or, or um, citric acid, or um, there's, a, there's a variety of ways to, to uh, preserve color. Um, and again, it's not necessarily, it's not, it's not critical for safety, but you know, it looks nice. You don't want, your, you don't want things to look good, right? <laughs> so, um, and everything that has a link, by the way, is, um, well, actually I'll follow one of those links and just show you. So the, um, so there's a National Center for Home Fruit Preservation. They give an example of why blanching is so important to slow those enzymes down that rot our food. Um, and it's, again, it's, it's, it's not going to be as, as good as fresh produce, of course, but freezing and uh, dehydrating really preserve the, the flavor a lot better than, than other methods. Um, like canning is a little bit more of a process. So all of these are processed food and yeah, we, um, yeah, I'll just stop there. <laughs> so anyways, because I only have an hour, I'm going to try and squish a lot in here. I really want to get to canning because I saw a lot of comments in the chat that the uh, people really wanted to do that. Okay, so I'm going to talk about freezing next. So I talked about um, blanching a little bit already. Now, the great thing is, in my books anyway, because I love making, um, um, oh my gosh, what are they called? Enchiladas, anything with onions and green peppers. Those are the only two vegetables that don't require blanching ahead of time. The only two. So I have, before I took this course, <laughs> I did throw things in the freezer without blanching them. And I ended up, I just ended up throwing them out after. They just, they really uh, don't taste well. They don't taste good. The texture is not very good. So you take the time, you just bring a big pot of water to boil, a rolling boil. And then, and there's, um, uh, I don't know if I put it in here, but it is in another, another thing. There's a, there's a, oh, that's right. It's in the blanching link in the previous slide. So there's a, there's a set time for each fruit or vegetable that you need to, um, to blanch it at. You just you put in the boiling water, you take it out with a, a strainer and put it immediately in cold water or preferably like an ice water bath in your sink or in a big bowl and it'll stop the uh, the cooking process and you can just and then you just freeze it. It's pretty simple. I have a list there to have containers for freezing um, with headspace. Um, I'm not sure if I put it in the next slide or not. No, I didn't shoot. There we go. So headspace is just the amount of air. You want to get as much air out of the container as possible. I tend to use um, Ziploc bags because you can squeeze all the air out. And if you're preparing something for someone else and you don't want to, um, you don't want to like, what would we do, right? We, we suck the air out of the bag, right? So you don't want to necessarily put your mouth on that bag if you're preparing food for someone else. So you use the straw, put it inside the Ziploc bag and use that to suck the air out. Works like a charm. And there's only a tiny little hole at the end that you have to clip up to seal it. So that's uh, a really handy technique that I learned in that course. And then the rest of that, uh, you know, how long can I store frozen food? That's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, I got nine minutes left before I want to get onto the canning. <laughs> so drying, dehydrating, it's one of my favorite things to do. I put a picture of kale there because I love making kale chips in a dehydrator. Super simple. If you ever want my recipe, I'll happily share it with you. Um, but uh, dehydrating is, um, it's, uh, there's a, you know, there's that with dehydrating, that's where the cutting gets really important because you want a, a uniform size of whatever you're dehydrating. Um, because if you have a thick slice and a thin slice, it dehydrates at different times and you know, it just, it, it becomes very time consuming. So you want everything to be kind of like evenly sliced. A lot of times with dehydrating too, you need to um, do some sort of preparation to the food. 
to make sure that the color stays as good as possible. And it does shrink a lot, obviously, because it's being dehydrated. And also to, just to keep in mind that when you're rehydrating any food, let's say you make a soup mix. So that's what I did with the, that's zucchini noodles in the bottom picture there. Um, I soaked them in salt water first, drained it all out, and then dehydrated them all. So the next time I made a, any kind of stew or soup, I would just take a handful of these dried zoodles. I called them zoodles because it's fun. Threw them in the soup. And it you do lose um, you do lose some nutrients when you dehydrate. If you eat the the raw product, like the uh, like you're losing a little bit of nutrients when you if I ate you know this kind of thing, the uh, dried apple slices. But if I want to rehydrate it, I lose even more if if that makes any sense. So I'm going to leave that there. It's fairly self-explanatory. I'll just mention that last item on that list. Those are just some of the items that you would need to dehydrate. Um, when you have small fruit, like blueberries, cranberries, I do a lot of cranberries, you either cook them so they burst or, which again, processes them. Or if you really want to make sure that you're getting as much nutrients out of the food as possible, you check them. So you take a pin and you just check each individual fruit, which takes forever. But if you left it whole, it takes forever to dehydrate. It takes a long time because all the water is kind of trapped inside that, that shell and it just takes a lot longer. So if you just pierce a hole, just one hole, and just kind of go through them all and put them on your trays, or if you're putting in the oven, um, it makes it a lot quicker to dehydrate. And it's a, a nicer product too at the end, to be honest. Okay, so there's a couple types of dehydrators. I've used both. I prefer the square one. It's uh, It blows all the air straight through instead of bottom up. And um, also the, the one that I used anyway, the round one had only one temperature setting. And I like the other one because I can take the trays out and I can put in, I can make yogurt in there. I can do all sorts of things in there. I don't have to restrict myself to just putting things on trays. So that's just a personal preference. Everybody has their own and not everybody can afford those. So I did provide a link there to um, methods that you can use to uh, not even use a dehydrator. Uh, you can use your oven. You can use the sun. So this is just one, something I made. It is shareable. So you know, anyone should be able to click on it forevermore. So there's just some examples there. You, know, you can see how they have them very evenly sliced, all the same, you know, and that's kind of what they look like when they're dry. Yeah, toaster oven, sun dry. And for herbs and small fruits, you can actually microwave them, especially herbs. It works, it works quite well. You know, I've done it myself. Typically, though, for herbs, because they are so they're, they're fairly easy to dry, that's what I use my paper bags for. I just put them in a paper bag and, you know, for uh, a couple of days. Um, oops, there we go. For a couple of days and, uh, you know, they're dry. So it's not too hard. All right. Fermenting. I love fermenting. And I'm glad that actually the person who taught me how to can sauerkraut in a jar like that is in the room, I believe. I think I saw his name earlier. It's a really uh, sauerkraut you get right in there. It's just cabbage and salt and a lot of mashing and, <laughs> and pounding and, and you stuff it in a jar and you let it sit for a few days and then you have sauerkraut. So fermentation is a lot of fun. Um, it's not necessarily, you don't have to have um, sterile, completely sterile jars, but they have to be very clean. With all of these things, they all have the basic, the basic, the basics are the same. Because when we're when we can talk about water bath canning, we put it in the water bath or we put it in the pressure canner to heat up. So it doesn't need to be sterile because it's already being heated up. It's already being. Uh, it, it should be clean when it goes in there, though. You don't want to can anything with or ferment anything with their with your food, right? So. So I'm going to leave those links for you to explore. The Wild Fermentation book, by the way, is wonderful. It's by, a, he's kind of a guru to fermenting fermenting people. His name is Sandor Katz. And uh, just a wonderful, wonderful book. Not very expensive. If you have access to it, boy, from the library. If you want to get into fermenting, it's a lot of fun. So a lot of people are here for canning. I'm just going to quickly check the chat here. Yes. Awesome. I love it too. So I left a couple of um, links here. The pressure canning one pager is from the, um, actually from the Master Food Preserver course. 
Green Eye Co-op, who I don't believe exist anymore, unfortunately, put this together, which is like just a one pager, which is amazing because more usually you get you go on the internet and they're like 12 pages of instructions or you know, however long, but it's really, it's really once you know the process and you're brave enough to try it or you're brave enough to have someone show you how to do it and you do it with them it's it's so much fun and it's just amazing the uh for me it's amazing what the uh the food security i get out of it knowing i have food that i can eat you know like meat and potatoes and vegetables you know i can eat jam too but i wouldn't want to survive on it so so the differences between so i'm going to leave that for you to explore later and i'm going to get into the differences between um, canning, water bath canning, and uh, pressure canning. These are just some pictures from work. Well, this is this one gentleman was like amazing at one of the workshops I did, so I had to put his picture in there. <laughs> I'll come back to that picture in a minute. So on the right, you have that that uh, that lovely diagram. I believe it's from that so easy to preserve book. So when you're talking about water bath canning versus pressure canning. Um, you're looking at the acid content of food. So the you have to use a pressure canner. I have it here. I have my big pressure canner right here um, for low acid foods. So vegetables, meat, um, onions, uh, carrots. Now they have pumpkins there. Sometimes tomatoes, depending on their acid content. I'm actually, yeah, no, I'll wait till later for that. Um, so that's really what you look at. So um, fruits are high acid foods, especially like cranberries. They actually have a lot of pectin in them, which kind of helps them solidify. Apples, high acid. So that's fine to use a water bath. So a water bath canning is, sorry about my dryer's going off. <laughs> it's such a loud noise. I don't know if you can hear it. <laughs> I'll just wait for it to stop. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Don't you love doing these things at home? Um, so water bath canning is where the the jar and the top of the jar and on top of the rack has to be actually submerged in boiling water at least an inch above the top of the jar the top of the jar once it's properly sealed. Pressure canning um, uses a lot less water because it uses the pressure from the steam in the canner to build up the temperatures needed to safely preserve the food. And that's why the, I had the temperatures for food preservation there because um, if you, let's say you, you have this old recipe from your great grandmother and you're like, oh, she canned carriage in the water bath canner and it was all fine, you know, it's actually not food safe. They've determined that that's not food safe anymore. You can, you can can them, but they have to go in the fridge and you eat them within a week, just like any other kind of freshly prepared food. If you water bath can it, it just doesn't get to the temperatures required to kill those botulism spores and all those other things that will, you know, are not good for our health, not good for us to eat or to serve our family. Um, so pressure canning actually does reach those temperatures with a with at least one exception that I can think of, but you have, yeah, and you can actually pressure can um, applesauce and different things in a pressure canner too. It's a lot, it's a little bit more timely than using time consuming than a water bath canner, but um, I'm going to move on to the next one because this is the uh, this is a good step, I think. <laughs> How am I doing for time anyway? Oh, it's only 20 after seven. We might have lots of times for for questions. So um, actually, you know what? I'm going to do a quiz first. I'm going to stop the share. So. OK. Oh, that's a good question, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, basically. It's you don't you don't need to test the pH of your food. Basically, um, fruits, all fruits are high acid food. Um, basically, all vegetables and meat are low acid. So that's a general rule of thumb. With um, tomatoes or salsa or that sort of thing, you add acid. Like you'll add lemon juice, for example, to bring it up to higher acid, just in case the tomatoes are not. Because, you know, the, depending on your crop, your tomatoes could be a little bit lower acid and maybe not totally safe. So you just add citric, you add, yeah, you add, uh, you add lemon juice. It is really simple, <laughs> totally. So now that we have the discussion about low versus high acid foods, 
I'm gonna maybe test you guys. Okay, so. I got relish. Anybody guess what relish would be? So the ingredients are vinegar, this is green tomato relish, red peppers, sugar probably. Yes, high acid, very good. And why is it high acid? Because there's vinegar. Because they're, they're vegetables, right? Green tomatoes, but we added, I added vinegar to them and a whole bunch of other seasonings. It takes forever to make relish. Oh my God, chopping it for days. <laughs> it's not days, but okay. How about uh, potatoes? White potatoes. Low, oh, yes, exactly. And these are just these are just literally potatoes. I don't even you can put salt in them, but I typically I don't put I don't add any salt to things. So how about apple pie filling? It's a trick. This is a trick question, maybe. Oh, you guys are smart. I can't even fool you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it's actually water bath canned because there's fruit in it, but it's also it's also got um, something called uh, clear gel, which is the only thickener you can use in canning. It's a commercial product, um, and I'll, I'll, I have a, little, a slide a little bit later, but it's uh, with, um, you, you don't use any thickeners, no cornstarch, no flour, no butter, um, nothing to, because the, uh, first of all, it can clump when you're canning, and um, it can actually cause uh, air pockets to form, and it just, it, it, isn't, it, creates, it creates environments that bacteria can grow bad bacteria can grow, so. Okay, you guys are good. I thought it would stump you on that one, to be honest, but no fooling you. This one's probably pretty easy to figure out. Salmon, Atlantic salmon, no less. Low, okay, <laughs> yes. And I wanted to show you my jar. So can anybody see what, uh, everybody comments on this when they see my jars. Anybody notice anything about them? There's no rings, right, exactly. Does anybody know why I do that? Why it's recommended? So it's not necessary. Once it's sealed, like I cannot pull that off anyway. This is, uh, um, you know, it's impossible to get off, but this is a pressure can product and he, in the water pan product, actually I'll get a water pan one too. So when you're storing your jars, um, you can create what's called a false seal. Exactly, Zaria, thank you. If you had, if I left it with the ring on and I stored it in my, I have everything in my basement. Let's say the seal broke and it didn't, uh, and I didn't realize that the, the food was was starting to spoil. Um, it, you would eat the food and, and not realize that the seal had been broken. If you, if I go into my basement, I always pick it up, pick up I'm going to go to pick up my jars to, to serve them. I always check the seal. So it doesn't, uh, I can't create a false seal if the ring's not on it. And also what happens, it just kind of like slides off, like the bacteria starts to grow and and then it just kind of slides off. So it's it's real easy to, it's real easy to, to tell that um, the seal has been broken. You have to throw it out. Even if it looks good, smells good, please don't take a risk, just throw it out. Even if it was pressure can, it took forever, <laughs> please just throw it out. Um, also, you don't stack for the same reason. You don't stack your jars together for the same reason. You don't want to create that false seal, even without the ring on it. So, good. Uh, I don't think I have an empty one. Okay, go back to the presentation. I think I'm doing okay on time. So these are the, just the two process, types of processes that you can do when you're um, pressure or what usually usually raw packing is only for pressure canning because it's um, usually um, meat. You know what I mean? Well, I guess I guess fruit too, but um, typically I've done uh, raw packing. So raw pack is you're uh, you're putting hot liquid over raw food, and hot pack is hot food into a hot jar. And that's another, that's another tip too. If you remember nothing else, when you're canning, you want to have hot jars, hot foods. So what I do is I just, I start them in my canner, put the empty jars in my canner. 
by the way, I use this, this is my pressure canner, but I also, I use it for both water bath and pressure canning. So I put my water in there for what, let's say it's water bath. I put all my jars in there, let the water heat up, heat up the jars. And then I do my canning process, which unfortunately I wouldn't have enough time to show you today, but um, I can just give you the basics and the overview. Um, so you want a hot food in a hot jar, because if you put hot food in a cold jar, what might happen? And it has happened to me before. <laughs> Does anybody know? Has anybody been witness to this? Yes, it breaks, exactly. Yeah, I've done it once before. Kablamo, exactly. So, and it also, I also even heat my, um, oh, I said it must be in the next one. I also heat my, my lids. So there's lids and rings. So the jar is in three parts, at least the canning that I do. Um, it's not gonna show it. The jar is in three parts. So that there's a two part lid and then the jar itself. So that's the lid, that's the ring. And you, you put the lid on and then you put your ring on fingertip tight. But I even heat up my lids because even it's it provides a, it's a little bit better seal. I don't heat them up much. I boil water in the kettle, put them in a pot, put them on a stove at like three or four, very kind of like low to medium, just to keep them warm. And then when I'm ready to can, I take them out and do my thing. Some people also put them in the, like the big pot, but I find it's hard to get to dig them out if the water's kind of deep. So just having a separate pot is another little trip, tick, tip, tip. I can talk really. <laughs> so controlling headspace. So this is the headspace is the distance from the top of the jar or the bottom of the lid, I guess, technically to the top of the food. And there's a really neat little trick that I also learned in that uh, master food preserver thing. So um, I think it's back a little ways. I'm just gonna go back to the, see the jar here, okay? You see how there's where the, not the seam, whatever that thing's called, that little piece of glass that sticks out. That actually is a general guideline. So that bottom, I don't know if you can see my cursor right now, but that bottom ring here, line here, is about an inch of headspace. This is about a half an inch of headspace, and this is about a quarter inch of headspace. And those are basically the only headspaces that people ask you for in recipes. Quarter inch tends to be for um, jams and jellies. An inch, oh yeah, there we go. Half an inch for fruits and tomatoes and one to a one and quarter inch for low acid foods. So because the food, like for the apple pie filling, for example, um, I had to blanch the apples because there's a lot of air in uh in food like that so if i hadn't blanched the apples i don't think it would have fit in this jar it would have as soon as it heated up in uh, the water bath canner it would have leaked out and been everywhere so that's just a little tip you can also buy the um the funnels and they actually have them marked on them the headspace which is a little bit you know it, it's not totally necessary but if you find yourself without one of those funnels it's you can just use that trick so this is where these things that are not safe to food not food safe to can um so dense purees they, um so i can pumpkin all the time but i don't puree it first i don't puree i don't can uh like butternut squash pureed soup and well for a couple of reasons because it also has dairy in it so i just can the product by chopping it into chunks pressure canning it in the ways that the so easy to preserve book tells me to um, and then when I'm ready to prepare the food, I'll mash it up. I'll make it into whatever pie or soup or whatever it happens to be. Um, dairy products, um, no butter, no milk, no cheese. Same thing. You add them after. You add them when you're cooking, when you've opened the can and you're ready to cook. Oil, I can't remember the exact reason for oil, other than I believe it changes the density of the product and makes it unsafe. Doesn't It can't bring it up to the right level, the temperature level. And then I already talked about starches. Like I said, the only exception is clear gel, which you can order on Amazon. You can, I have never seen it in a store, but it's very, very available everywhere online. Uh, pasta and rice. So your favorite chicken rice soup recipe, you can make a chicken soup recipe, chicken vegetable soup recipe, but just not, you can add, you'd add the pasta and rice after the fact. So there's a, I talked about this earlier. 
So lobster is a big thing here in the Atlantic coast. And I always get uh, comments about this one. Um, people sell lobster a lot. I, I, I see it all the time, Facebook marketplace, especially this time of year. So uh, by all means, you can certainly bottle lobster, but you cannot store it on the shelf. It is not food safe to keep canned lobster on the shelf. Lobster cannot be the only way to safely preserve lobster by pressure canning it is to cook it at such high temperatures that it's it loses all consistency. It's a lobster bisque. It's not, it's just not, it's not very appetizing. Nope, applesauce is, uh, it's not a dense puree, no. Nope, it's, uh, we're talking about like um, dense vegetables like potatoes, um, pumpkin. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of air in apples. Yeah, mostly like root vegetable kind of purees like butternut squash. That's not a root vegetable, but you know what I mean? <laughs> it's mostly like, um, yeah, it's mostly vegetables, I guess. Maybe because applesauce is so high in acid, it's it's not an issue. But but lobster, um, I always ask people the question, have you ever seen lobster for sale in the grocery store? Like even in the refrigerator section, the only place you see lobster for sale in commercially is frozen or fresh, of course. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they they won't sell it in the grocery store because it's not safe. They, they, it, so next time you see someone selling lobster, you know, um, yeah, just don't. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> um, so I have a link there to both of those explanations, more explanations. And lobster can be, it's really easy to preserve by freezing it. You freeze it whole. Don't even, don't even cook it first. Just you freeze it. Well, maybe, maybe cook it first, but don't take it out of the shelf. It's it's uh, best quality if you just wrap it up tightly, get as much air as you can out of the bag and put it in the freezer like that. Okay. It, I think either or, you know what? Let's check. I think we got time. Is it says, yeah, frozen, uncooked. There we go. There's our answer. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> so those are just resources to explore on your own. Um, I put one en Francaise aussi. Uh, it's a really good link, actually. So Food in Jars is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite sites. She's just uh, really, I actually got her email today, her newsletter today. She's got a lot of, she's very, I find her very simple, very easy to understand. She um, does a lot more than just canning. It's basically Food in Jars. Her recipes are very current. It's a, I highly recommend that site. I highly recommend all of them, but it's just kind of like a place for you to go. Or you could always invite me to come and uh, do a workshop for you. So I did want to talk about something else. I do. Oh, wow. I can have lots of time for questions. Oh, that's right. I wanted to show you. I'm going to stop the screen share. So there's... Um, I made a mess. So I have my canning basket, <laughs> which... Uh, Oh my gosh. Every time I can, it comes it comes out along with the canner itself. I wanted to just uh, kind of like take things out of my canning basket. This is a second rack for a pressure canner. One of the great benefits of a pressure canner is we only you only put in about this much water. And so you can actually put two rows of jars. So this canner, I can't remember how many gallons it is. It's, a, it's called a Presto, and um, I can do 16 jars, 16 pint jars at once in here, which is great when I'm making like salmon or whatever, because the process, like the actual cooking time, getting it up to pressure is, uh, it might be only uh, uh, and like an hour and 10 minutes, but heating up the canner, getting it to pressure, then you start the timer and then the, the other side of it, letting the pressure come off, and letting it cool enough to open. So the whole process takes quite a while, but the act, most active part of the process is just bringing it up to the right pressure. So that's what uh, the top of the pressure canner looks like. There's a, uh, this this shows you when you're, when it's actually pressurized, the canner's pressurized. This is called the vent cap. And there is a piece that goes on top of there, also in my basket. 
So when you're after you've after you've kind of like brought the temperature up and you've you've you vented the cap, it's called, you let it vent for 10 minutes, make sure that this is a clear, kind of a clear space for the steam to come out. You actually cap it. And then within a couple of minutes, your temperature gauge starts to come up. So the most important thing about pressure canning is number one, they are very safe now. Uh, they're not going to explode. I guarantee you they won't explode. There's actually, there's a little rubber seal here that if it does get close to, you know, being dangerously about to, you know, it'll start to rock and stuff like that, but that'll burst and uh, it'll, it'll just vent all the steam out of there. So they are very safe. I, maybe they didn't used to be, but I was very intimidated the first time I pressure can, and now I can't get enough of it. So actually, that's a good, that's another good question um, that was in the chat there. You cannot can in anything but a pressure, well, you could do, well, like, I don't know what Instapot, but so an Instapot is not a pressure canner. Um, it can be a pressure cooker. You can, I can cook in a pressure canner, but I can't can in a pressure cooker, if that makes any sense. Um, it's just, uh, it's just, yeah, this is, this is a, a steam-based appliance. And yeah, I've never tried to pressure cook in it, but um, what else did I want to talk to you guys about? So I got my clear gel in here. I have my handy dandy lifter. This is actually to lift, it's a magnetic wand to lift the uh, the lids out of a hot water. And that's why I don't want to put it in my deep pot because it's really way too short. I don't want to dig out, I don't want to stick my hands in boiling water. This is a jar lifter. And for years I thought I did it this way. Anyways, that's just me, <laughs> it's this way. Um, masking tape, masking tape, I, I'm, so I, I, I say this is my canning basket, but this is my food preservation basket. Masking tape, um, black markers, very important to have in your arsenal because you got to mark your jars. And yet for freezing, it's really important to put the date of the product or to write what the what the product is. You know, piece of piece of masking tape, a brief description of what you actually froze. Because, oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many times I open my freezer and I'm like, oh. What is that green thing again? Is it zucchini? Is it green peppers? I don't know. I can't tell. So try to always remember to label your jars with what it is and the date. So I don't I don't save those. Um, some of the canning, the boxes of canning things have the, those little stickers, you know. So I just you can just write with marker right on the lid. And that's that's how I always do it. Really simple. Um. Oh, I did talk about, also I forgot to mention with dehydrating, you don't need to have mason jars or anything else, but with canning, you have to use mason jars. You have to use new lids. Yes, every time you don't reuse lids. Again, people will say, well, I do, or my grandma does, or, you know, my mom always did. It's, it's, uh, it's, it would be a shame to go through the whole process of pressure canning only to lose, you know, four or five seals because you used old lids. They're not designed to be used twice, especially with pressure canning. Pressure canning, sometimes it's like, maybe I should open, I'm gonna open the potatoes just to show you. So the seal is, is quite, it's pressure can seal is like, it's on there. So the only way to get them open is to cut, there we go, a nice pop. Usually it bends the lid. It'll actually bend the lid. So that seals toast. I can use it, I can put this in a fridge. I can eat it within a week but I can't, I can't can anything else again with it. But when you're fermenting or dehydrating, that sort of thing, you can use any jars you want. Use all those jars you've got in the cupboard. Uh, what else am I gonna show you in here? There is um, another really good book. So Marissa McLennan does a lot of low sugar canning. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people do. A lot of people use them twice, but um, yeah, it's just not recommended. They're not designed that way. And they're not very expensive. I think it was $4 for a jar of lids. You can use the rings as many times as you like. And that that brings up another, another thing too. Every time I'm canning, I inspect the rings. If there's dents in them, if there's rust in them, like somebody mentioned earlier, um, just toss them, reuse another one. I save all my rings. This is just a box of rings. <laughs> so... You generally, when you've been doing it a while, especially because you take the rings off to store them. 
So you always end up having a ton of rings around and the lids aren't expensive enough. To me, they're not expensive enough to, to warrant possibly uh, losing the, the food. So, and not having a good seal on them. So uh, this is called Pomona's pectin. It's used in low sugar. A lot of us want to watch our sugar, low sugar canning. Um, if I had more time, I might be able to get into that a bit more, but just to, to know there is a way to, there's uh, some recipes that are very safe, safe to can and they use less sugar. Sugar isn't necessarily essential for the um, food preservation process, but sometimes the sugar is a quarter two. Nice. You're doing sometimes. great for time if you want to keep going. Well, yeah. I'm pretty well done. I just wanted to, yeah, the sugar can, can um, like when you're canning a jam or a jelly, sugar and pectin work together to create that nice gel factor, right? So Pomona's pectin just uses a lot less sugar, but it's a different, it's a different, just a diff little bit of a different technique. It's more of a three-part technique than a two. And this here, does anybody know what this is? <laughs> Part of my pressure canner, that's a hint. Is it yeah. some type of seal? It's the seal, exactly. This is the difference between my, making my, or gasket, you're right. That's another word for it. This is the difference between this being a water bath canner or a pressure canner. So right now it's a water bath canner. And now it's a pressure canner. Without that seal, it, it, it just does not, the pressure doesn't build up and you just, yeah, you can't get the heat that you need to safely preserve the food. And also one last book, and it's gonna seem kind of weird to recommend this. This is the, my pressure canner book. The, the book that came with my brand new pressure canner. It's not brand new anymore. It's amazing. I I just followed it step by step the beginning, and it was it even shows you know how to use it before using it for the first time. They recommend uh, canning water for the first your first round just to get a sense of you know how it heats up and how it cools down and yeah exactly. So that was my last book recommendation. And yeah, that's about it. I I do have vinegar in my canning basket as well. Does anybody know why I have vinegar in my canning basket? <laughs> the last question of the night. So when you're doing the process, when you're, uh, it's, it is a cleaning product for French fries. <laughs> no, it's not to increase the acid. It's actually when you're, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Susan and the Zaria. So when you're canning things that are a bit greasy, so you never add grease, you never add oil or butter or anything, but let's say you're canning, uh, well, salmon, for example, the, uh, the, normally you wipe the rims with water before you put the lid, before you put the lid on, but with those products, you use vinegar to wipe the rims because it cuts through the grease and uh, it gives you, it, it helps ensure you have that good seal. So that was fun. And we got, more than 10 minutes wow I thought that was, yeah. amazing. That was so fantastic yeah my questions yeah thank you so much. Much. It reminded me <laughs> that I had canned seal in Labrador and how weirdly bizarre that was but also really really oh. interesting. um that was amazing okay so I'm gonna open the floor to any questions in the chat yes. Q and a um, you've got the the driver's wheel, Michelle. So if anybody's like raising the hand in the bottom of the screen, sure. I'll mute them. Okay. Um, so I'll give I'll it a mute them. them. Yeah, yeah, if there's the participants list, right? Yeah, you can just unmute all the participants if you want. Um, people can raise their hand, put stuff in the chat. I have a few questions myself, but I'll I'll there open we up go. and then oh, we've got a QA coming in. Can okay. you can you can, can you can, can you can things with their skins on? That's a great question, Nicole. Yes, actually yeah. with salmon, for example, and that's a personal preference thing. It's not a food safety thing. Um, like for with salmon, for example, they want you to can it with the skin on and the skin out because the, uh, I don't know if you can see it very well there. You can see the beautiful skin. It looks nice, but it's also because um, when you take the food out, it doesn't stick to the side of the jar. So with salmon, especially, or any fish, you leave the skin on 
you don't have to eat it necessarily. And it's, and it's great with canned salmon. It is just like, you know, when you open a can of salmon from the grocery store, the bones are really soft. Same thing happens when you can it at home. It's wonderful. Oh, it is, Heather. I love my canning basement. <laughs> Come visit anytime. Anytime. You're in Mary Machine, not that far. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, that's where the Q&As are. Okay. Yes. If you take the lids out of warm water, do you still need to wipe the rinse with water? Yeah, well, that's, you do, because the jar itself is what needs to be wiped. There's, um, especially like with jams. Yeah, I always use... Um, a brown paper towel that's in my canning basket too. I just wet it. And I usually do, at the beginning, I did one at a time, take the hot jar out, put it on the counter, fill it with hot food, let's say jam, you know, check my head space, take out air pockets. That's another thing I have in my canning basket is a chop chopstick. They're great to take out air pockets because you don't want air, too much air in the jar either because that can break your seal. Um, but then you need to, you take the, the lid out of the warm water and before you put it on the top of the jar, you need to wipe the rim of the jar. Do I have an empty jar? Jeez, I don't even have, I must have an empty jar. There we go. So you just wipe, the, you're wiping the rim of the jar, then you're putting the lid on top. Then you're tightening it. They call it fingertip tight. You don't want to, uh, it's hard to show online, but you don't want to like wrench it closed. You're just closing it. You're just closing it enough because the way the process works is air goes in between the, the lid, the ring, and the food. It circulates, and it creates a vacuum pressure, and it seals the jar as the food and the air and whatever heats up. That's why headspace is super important. Always maintain the proper amount of headspace, not too little, not too much. It makes a big difference in uh, actually sealing the food or sealing the jars. Okay. Where do I, oh, that's a good question. Um, ooh, that's a very good question. So Presto, the, the canner, the canner itself was my most expensive purchase. It was at the time it was $200 and that was before COVID. I saw on, during COVID, it was just insane. Like the prices of canning supplies. Um, but um, generally for like lids and rings, uh, the jars themselves, the jars themselves, I find at at uh, Value Village all the time. Like the people are always giving away the jars, you know. So you can get really inexpensive jars, even wide mouth mason jars. They're my favorite. I I always try to can salmon in them. It just makes it easier. Uh, Value Village has them all, but and the and the and the lids themselves. Well, I have never ordered them in bulk to save money. I just generally get them at the grocery store. I usually wait until canning season, early fall, and they tend to go on sale. And I just buy enough, of however I need. Um, why did my top pop off during PC? PC? I don't know what PC means. Oh, pressure canning. Chili was everywhere. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, maybe your headspace was off. And it, uh, yeah, I've had, I've had lids, like, just come off during the canning process, like, in the canner. And, yeah. I've had, I've had my jars break, even doing everything right. It's still just, you know, that's all I can guess. So for eggs, eggs are, um, I've never tried that. Apparently you cannot can eggs. That was another one of the uh, products that are not recommended for canning. Um, you can pickle them and put them in the fridge, but I, yeah, I've never tried that particular thing. And freeze drying, I'd love to try. It's on my list one of these days. Also steam canning is a newly approved way to it's like water bath canning but it's not pressure canning like it's for things that are that are high acid um yeah it's on my list i'd love to try it if you guys ever get a freeze dryer do you want me to come down and test it with you i'm all in it i'm all in <laughs> of all the methods you've mentioned what would be your recommendation who hasn't done any preserving well that's a good question so um fermenting is very accessible so every time I do a workshop on pressure canning, we ferment while we're waiting for, like we set up ferments while we're waiting for the pressure canner to heat up or whatever, because it's um, really just, it's just mixing vegetables and salt together and, you know, putting them in a jar, or, you know, or a crock as Brianna's husband does, the big massive <laughs> crocks. <laughs> um, 
I started my first ferment was uh, carrots, fermented carrots. It's delicious. They're like pickle. They taste like pickles, but they're not super vinegary. They're just really easy to do. Uh, for canning, um, uh, that's really a personal choice. With the uh, every workshop I've done, they've they've asked to do specific food. So one actually one one place we did uh, moose stew. That was the first thing they ever canned. And that was after the fermenting workshop. And um, beets, pickled beets. That was a good one too, because you get a scent. It's a water bath can product. So you get a sense of how it is to water bath can, but it's also, it's in a vinegar and it, there's a certain process. You got to cook the food first and blanch it first. Jams are a little harder to start with because it can get kind of picky to get a set point. But uh, yeah, I hope that answers the question. What about vegetables and fruit skins? Oh yeah, you, you can you can can them. Again, it's um, like I have can, I should have brought the pears up. I have pears in the basement right now that I left the skins on because that doesn't bother me to eat pear skins. But some people it's just like, it doesn't, you know, because those are water bath canned. So it depends like, so if it's a water bath canned products, the skin is still gonna have that texture. With vegetables like um, um, like carrots and that sort of thing, I tend to peel them. I don't. You can leave them on, and again, it just it just maybe that won't look as perfect as it would without because carrots everything retains its texture. You saw with the potatoes, it retains its texture. It doesn't it doesn't get all turned to mush, so it would still have the skin and it'd still have the yeah. So how did you get apple filling to the top without siphoning? Oh, it siphoned a couple of them. So I did, I just did this batch. So siphoning is what happens when um, some of the product leaks out of the jar while it's cooling. And it, it it's still sealed, but I did, I think I did in two batches because they're big jars. I did, I think 12 jars and three of them siphoned. So I think it was maybe I had a little bit too much uh, I started with headspace down here. It just expanded while it was cooking to there. And this one, maybe I had a little bit of, I, I can see a couple of air pockets in there. So maybe I didn't take out the air pockets as well, but it's siphoning will actually like food will leak out, like especially applesauce. I've never made applesauce where it didn't siphon after because it's still, it's still bubbling and it's still doing that vacuum seal thing. And the, the applesauce will actually leak down the side of the jar. So after it's cooled, I test my seal. If it's good, I wash it off, put it in the, the basement, the basement of bounty. <laughs> if the lid doesn't pop, is it spoiled? Um, right. Yeah. If it's, if it, you can tell by the seal on the jar. So an unsealed jar, it's not spoiled. Like if you just canned it and it didn't, and it didn't pop, I don't, you can probably not see that, but there's a little, little bit of a convex. It, you know, to the, the lid when it's sealed. Yeah, I can't see it, but it's concave. So um, it's not spoiled, but you have to use it. It's just like a fresh product now. Like I just opened this jar. It's now a fresh product. I can't put it back on the shelf. I wouldn't store it anymore. I put it in the fridge and use it hopefully within a week. How can we sure the used pressure can are still safe to use? That one is a, that's a good question. There's, um, um, there's apparently there's ways you can test them. Um, I think you have to go on the, first of all, I would make sure it's one you recognize like a Presto canner and make sure it's a, a canner. Like I've never seen a canner at Value Village or anywhere else, but um, you check all the things. So you make sure the gasket is um, pliable. It's not dried out, it's not cracked. You might have to order, I would order, personally, I would probably order a new gasket if I did find a, an old pressure canner because uh, that's, your, that's, your main, that's your main thing that's gonna make sure you're, you got a good seal or not. You, you make sure there's no rust and to make sure all the working, all the parts are there. A lot of them are for sale and they, they wouldn't have this. Again, you can order it, make it safe to use. And there are some weighted, I've never used them, but there's a weighted pressure cooker. This is a, sorry, canner. This is a dial gauge pressure canner. It's got the dial gauge. 
There's another one with a, it's a weighted pressure canner and it uses a, a series of weights to, to, to let you know that you're at the right pressure level, but I'm not, uh, I'm not great with those. We did see them in the training we took, but I've uh, never used one, so. All right, can heat head space to get lit off there by saving? I'm not sure what that means. Yeah, it's like, it's just not, it's just not recommended. Like I said, people do it, but if you're following what the most recommended, most up-to-date methods are in home food preservation, they recommend using new lids every time. So I have to go, you know, <laughs> um, that's another, that brings up another uh, point that I was going to make earlier. So let's say you have uh you have your grandma's salsa recipe and you know it's it's the same one that everybody in the family has been making for 80 years or whatever it is um you really have to make sure that your so this is a water bath can product there is vinegar in it but because the like, salsa is one of those things that you know if there's too much green peppers or there's too many onions in it it should be it should be pressure canned so you got to be really sure that your um ratios are correct so i compare i would take an, an old recipe and compare it against a modern recipe for salsa and just make sure that there's not you know too much of a, an ingredient that like you know just just kind of seasonings are not usually an issue sugar is not usually an issue salt's not usually an issue the amount of vinegar is the amount of uh the fresh product is but the uh, the way it's seasoned it's not usually an issue in making sure it's food safe so I would just compare them against a modern, a modern recipe to make sure that it's safe. Water classic uses lime, I think. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna look that up, Zaria. Yeah. Do you have a preference for one type of? Oh my god. Yeah, it does. It does definitely depend on the right type of food. But I love pressure canning. Like I never thought I'd say that. I used to be so worried about it. It's the only. Yeah, <laughs> when in doubt, use a pressure canner. Yes and no. Like with fruit, you're you're pretty well safe to use a, a water bath canner. But um, I just I love pressure canning because first of all, it uses less water, and I'm all about saving water as much as I can. Um, it also, to me, it's it's like it's a really um, a really good seal. But pressure canning also processes the food. It's the most like there's the most nutrient loss with pressure canning. To be perfectly blunt because it's a longer process. It, um, like for a salmon example, for example, I think it's 90 minutes at um, 11 pounds of pressure. So it takes about, uh, to heat it up to pressure, it takes about 15 minutes or so. Then you're cooking it for 90 minutes at a high pressure, and then it's cooling down after for another half an hour. So that's, it's basically cooking for two hours. So, you know, that's, uh, it's, you don't want to like fruit exact for example, you, do you really want to process it that long? So, um, yeah, I think, uh, so I'm not sure if it would be safe to say when in doubt use a pressure canner, but I think we're just a bit over time. Got my husband this for Christmas. Oh, is that the cro the fermentation crock? Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I'm uh, lids at Dollarama. Yeah, actually, I've seen uh, lids at uh, our dollar store here in Rogersville. And I was, I'm actually going to test them out shortly. Well, not tonight, but the next few days. I also just wanted to show you quickly some fermentation kind of fancy things. So these are weights. When you're uh, fermenting, you want to keep all the products submerged in the brine. So you put this on top. Just It fits inside a mason jar, a wide mouth mason jar, perfectly. And they're pretty and they're fancy, but I've used rocks, like clean rocks, whatever works. And I got my pickle tops. I won't say whatever other people call them. It just uh, allows it to kind of burp. It just, uh, when the when the fermentation kind of process happens, the little bit of gas is built up and it just allows it to burp a little bit. These are fairly inexpensive. Yeah. 
Oh, we got some more. I didn't mute everyone, did I? Oh no. Oh, I thought I unmuted everybody. I'm so sorry. Or the butt of a cabbage. That's right. Yeah. That's another thing Daniel taught me with the uh the sauerkraut. Oh, I didn't realize that. I don't know where it is now. Shoot. See, this is what happens when you give me the uh the con. Allow panelists to unmute. Oh, it's panelists that I did. Oh no. <laughs> Oh my gosh, ask all to unmute. Is it working now? Yeah, you're great. No worries. It was just like they've restricted you completely. I'm sorry. So no, it's totally amazing. Um, one quick thing I did notice is that Heather Davenport had her name her hand raised. So I don't know if she's left or if she has a question. Oh. Heather, can you hear me okay? She had her hand raised earlier. Oh, oh, she can't. Okay. Did you have a question? Oh, you guys, they can't unmute. Okay. <laughs> so you just got to go through. It's okay. No worries, Michelle. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, you hit it by mistake. Oh, in that case, all good, man. You, that was incredible, <laughs> Michelle. We are like, that was really, really amazing. Um, so much well, engagement. You did a great job. We're really, really appreciative. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, to everybody on the call, we will be providing you all with um, the, the webinar uh, clipping and then also the slideshow. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Um, it was really, 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 really excellent. And we're going to bring you down to Charlotte County somehow. So that you can <laughs> you can show all of the things in real time in our farm in our farm space. That would I'm be so <laughs> awesome. amazing. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Again, um, so our next webinar will be happening in January. So in the meantime, I wish you all a wonderful holiday season. Um, and thank you so much. And remember to buy local this holiday season. Okay. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Awesome. Okay. So. People are headed out. I just want to, before we, you and I leave, Michelle, I just want to make sure I copy everything. I'm just going to stop the recording. Data. Yeah.